uh, ATV sponsoring an event, so we have great food, and uh, uh, we'll have. Uh, what are we doing? Do you want to say a few words about ATV, lunch analytics, analytics, data science, anything? Sure, I'll keep it super short. Uh, my name is Bill Mott, I'm the Vice Data Science Team at ATV. Uh, basically, a big thank you to Dan for organizing. We are uh, big fans of supporting the data science community in Calgary, whether that's uh, across all industries or within services. I'm so happy to support things like this. Um, I'd love to chat with me after if you want to talk more. Thanks. Well, great. So I'll just give you a bit of a picture uh, about what Lunchalytics is and why we're doing it, and then we'll start with our first speaker. So the uh, the idea itself, we started in Edmonton. Um, we've been doing this for about three years up there. Every month we have a speaker series, and we haven't reused that many speakers. So uh, there seems to be a lot of people willing to talk about this, and a lot of people willing to come. Uh, and the Edmonton event, uh, we kept running out of room uh, at about 60 or 70 people, and, and the event's been streaming now, uh, and we usually get uh, a few dozen people watching online. So today, we're going to try the same. I think we are going to, based on registrations, fill up. Uh, so you might have to move in. We'll, we'll use all the seats, most likely, uh, as the, the latecomers come in, and they'll probably have to sit at the front. Um, the whole point behind Lunchalytics, though, is to build the analytics community in the city, in Calgary. And so what our plans are is to run three of these events before the summer. Uh, we have this one on machine learning. We have another one in March March about uh, energy analytics, and another one probably in May uh, about data visualization. So the University of Calgary is also one of the supporters and uh, uh, hosts of the event. Our, our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Ray Patterson. He's going to be talking about machine learning in customer service reviews, so text analytics, text mining, and then putting models on that. Uh, but before we get to that, just a quick show of hands. How many of you here are producers of analytics? You actually create analytical products or tools or models. Okay, lots of producers. Okay, how many of you are consumers of analytics? You actually use the results to make decisions. Okay, okay, that's a good mix. And how many of you are academics or students? Okay, so just a couple of the acad academics here today. So. Those are kind of the main parts of the community we're looking to build. Uh, we typically see a similar mix, maybe a few more students uh, come out, especially when they find out about the free lunch. So uh, just one last thing before we start with the first speaker. Uh, the Lunchalytics website, hoping it becomes a bit of a hub for jobs in data science and for training programs in data science. So if you have a position that you're hiring for, in the area of analytics or data science, uh, feel free to use the uh, Lunch Analytics website. It's free. You can post your, a link to your position there. And it's definitely a target-rich environment. You'll get a lot of uh, data scientists uh, perusing the, the positions there. Which I'll show you where that is. A few jobs posted on there. Oh, just one. It was four, but they all got filled. So. They all got filled. Look at that. 100% fill rate. Um, and other training programs or events that come. We're, we're just trying to create a community uh, around this. So uh, the last thing I wanted to ask, is anyone actually hiring for data science or analytics positions right now? OK, so there's few. Why don't you just tell us what the, the organization is? Okay. Excellent. So if you didn't hear that, and for our folks who are uh, streaming online, uh, this is the University of Calgary Medical School. Uh, spine, surgical. spine Surgical Group at the U of C, uh, looking to hire data scientists to analyze data that's been collected on spinal cords. Spinal, spinal cord patients over the last five to ten years. Okay, and there's someone else a couple of rows back. Carrie? Uh, yeah, Canada. 
Okay, so that's Deloitte Consulting is looking to uh, build a data science team for data science consulting. And there's one more, I think. Dylan? Uh, although I think we actually just spoke we're hiring an AI developer, but we're hiring a possibly so Okay. And was there one more? Anyone else looking to hire? Okay. And so if you're looking for a job, you know who to talk to. You know, go find those people after as we network and eat. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ray, and he's going to kick us off with the inaugural Lunchalytics Calgary. That's yes. pressure. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so I have the entire uh, hour. Is that hour and a half. No, 15 minutes. <laughs> 15? 15 and then five for questions. OK. So, so you can pull up to 18. You'll give me a, a big wave at about 12. All right. OK. <laughs> well, thank you uh, to everyone for uh, allowing me to uh, speak uh, with you and for you. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is update you on uh, some exciting things that are happening at, happening at the University of Calgary in the analytics space. We have a new undergraduate major coming online, business analytics, uh, starting in the fall. And we're already putting our first students uh, through the uh, business technology management courses uh, in, in, on, on that side already. We've already uh, offered three uh, this year, and uh, so that's exciting. At the master's level, uh, it's at the approval stage of the government. Uh, we're hoping to start in the fall a data science and analytics program, uh, master's level. That's a combination of coming school and uh, in medicine and uh, biohealth informatics, uh, computer science, and Pascal. And uh, so that should, we hope that that will start in the fall. So that's exciting. And uh, lots of, lots of analytics type things happening in the University of Calgary. So if you have any questions about anything that's happening out there uh, with the space, or if you have jobs that you want to um, post for the undergrads, uh, for interns, or when they graduate, just give me a call and I'll look at Okay, so uh, my, uh, my research, uh, I wanted to, Dan asked me to do a case, so I said, hey, how about a paper that we've done? I said, great, that'll work. Uh, well, we had a problem with um, uh, California State Parks. They were going to close half of them. And a funny thing at the California State Parks, they were not allowed to gather customer satisfaction data. For whatever reason, by law in California, state park uh, officials, who, the people that run the state parks, are not allowed to ask the patrons how they feel. No problem. We'll figure out a way. And um, there's lots of customer feedback. Lots of things are out there. And uh, so we started to go after it. We wanted to create a method that would uh, create insight. Insight currently. Now this is applicable to any company who uh, uh, maybe you maybe you don't even collect it, but your uh, customer are gracious enough to provide their comments about you online. Uh, I found a few. Here's, here's the, um, oh, thank you. Let's see. Here's TELUS. Furious with TELUS. Oh, we don't want to look at that one. Oh, now they're unhappy. Another unhappy. I wonder if there's a way that we could pull or extract, dynamically extract, the information that's contained in all of this text. ATB, you didn't think you were going to be safe, did you? <laughs> Here's the, um, uh, this is from Glassdoor. It's, uh, again, it's um, employees who are uh, training. Uh, yeah, I wonder if there's a way to extract not only the components of satisfaction, the aspects, but also how much weight each one of those items should be assigned to comprise overall, in this case, employee satisfaction. ATB looks like everybody loves ATB. Oh, there's one. Only two. Okay. Well, we went to um, TripAdvisor. We said, 
maybe we could use this data. It's uh, public, uh, publicly accessible. And we use the, um, we use the comments to try and extract out meaning for each of the state parks in California. So, so sentiment analysis is going to analysis is going to bring together several fields: the text mining, the natural language, language processing, the data mining. All of that combined into uh, sentiment analysis. And what we were trying to do was push the field forward and do things that. Uh, we couldn't do before Okay, so What we wanted to do is beyond text mining It's one thing to do the text mining and uh, get the sentiments very it's a it's another thing to try and extract out meaning and uh, The components of customer satisfaction from that and we were able to do that with uh, pretty high uh, Reliability so our contributions uh, in this paper were uh, it was a method to discern the significant aspects of customer satisfaction that were expressed in this free form uh, media, and it was uh, for the customer reviews. It was TripAdvisor, and uh, so we created a method that uh, predicts the customer, the uh, contributor's overall satisfaction based on their text. So, for example, in TripAdvisor, yes, they give that to you, but what if uh, they, you have a, an environment where you don't know what their five-point satisfaction rating, and all you have is a rant, for example, a text of a phone conversation. Right? You've converted their, their comments that were given over the phone, and now that's all you have, and you aren't able to, uh, to ask them, oh, by the way, I know you're unhappy, but could you rate me from one to five? Our mechanism actually allows you to, uh, to predict pretty accurately what their rating is based on the text. Uh, so, two items. Now, a traditional questionnaire, people still do them, they're very expensive. Uh, and if you have incredible clairvoyance, that you already know what the, the components of satisfaction are, you can get pretty good results. In other words, it can pr probably tell you what you already know. And it's good, but what we were trying to do is figure out a way that would tell us things that we don't know anything about out of what people are telling us, the text. So, um, you know, the, um, oftentimes you're going to get very low prediction. The, uh, the R squared values are going to be very low. Uh, with our method, they were uh, extraordinarily high. So here we have an example of freeform text from the uh, Ewaldson Trail, and inside this text, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we want to pick out. So we've got the object, contributor, the reviews, there's opinions, there's aspects. So aspect is, think of these as the nouns, the views, the trails. Those are the, um, the nouns, and the opinions are all the non-nouns, the things that, uh, the, that you're talking about the nouns. And one of the big contributions of this paper was to, I know it sounds very simple, we simply split the data between the nouns and the non-nouns. And when you split the data between nouns and non-nouns, and uh, then your relevant range expands. Because when you normally train uh, text mining with the nouns in, uh, embedded, What's going to happen is, is that the, spe the specificities of a particular situation, those nouns, are going to be mixed in to the training of the text mining. By splitting that out and only considering the non-nouns, then you're using the words that you are using to describe maybe it could be any aspect. And so your relevant range can be much wider. And so that's uh, a key trick. So challenges, we had to deal with very uh, with unstructured data and uh, discover the relative importance of aspects from each of the uh, contributors' perspectives. So the unstructured data had to be split up, again, into the non-nouns, which are the sentiments, and the, um, or which I have to extract the sentiments, 
and the bag of nouns. So we've got the bag of non-nouns and the bag of nouns, and then I've got to recombine those with, um, with the weightings, because what I'm trying to do is get a magic combination, a magic powder, if you will. I want to know how much to weight each aspect or, or the, the noun, right? And how much relevance I should give to a negative con uh, comment about that aspect, or a positive one, or a neutral one. I need to be able to weight, and it, it is situation specific. So in the California State Park context, we, uh, so using, um, using k-means clusterings uh, method, k-means clustering method, we found uh, the uh, optimal set with, of, uh, of aspects was 13. Uh, different context, so if it was TELUS or if it was ATB, it would be a different set of nouns, uh, a different set of aspects, but this was California State Parks. And, um, and these related to all the very different types of California state parks. So they were, we chose this actually not only to be, uh, uh, to be helpful to them, but also because uh, there were a couple of features about the state parks that were pretty cool. First of all, the managers were unlikely to be uh, typing their own comments in there to try and, uh, uh, you know, as ma some managers are, are uh, accused of doing so. Uh, so we thought that this would be a pure set, a uh, pure, uh, pure uh, uh, test set. And, um, and then also the um, California state parks have three very different types of activities in their state parks. And the state parks are, uh, in a sense, it's very different business models. So one's beaches. Uh, that's a very different business model than the uh, historic museums. And the museums are going to have very different aspects compared to the beaches. And there's a third one, which is the nature, uh, interior natural parks. Uh, so um, not a beach, but still nature. Uh, so they tend to have very different aspects. So the, um, we use probabilistic modeling to, uh, so what we used was Bayesian modeling to uh, try to track in which the, the exact weightings of the aspects and sentiments uh, to, uh, to discover the relative importance. So we were able to do that. And so we created these aspect weights. And they, they had to be discovered. Uh, I won't bore you with the math. I did bring it then. It's just hidden. Um, but uh, I do have a paper that's been published on this. And so if anyone wants to uh, really get bored or they need some nighttime rating, uh, just email me and I'll, uh, I'll send that to you. Um, so we're going to use this free form text and then we're going to extract out the uh, frequency of positive, neutral, negative sentiments and then try to create a vector weighting that is going to be appropriate for each of those sentiments, for each of those uh, aspects. And uh, so our key contributions were proposing this Bayesian approach that linked the, what people are saying about you to their overall satisfaction. This, you know, I'm a five, or I'm a four, or I'm a three. And, um, and that, this model enables us to uh, estimate a single rating uh, for the discovered aspects, okay? And um, it's all from the contributor's point of view. The idea is that if you let them tell you what they're upset about or what they're happy about, they're probably telling you what they're happy about or upset about. So you can imagine that these are all the different, and these are all of the various um, state parks in California. Uh, could have done hotels, we could have done you name it, ranches, but this is what we did. And we created a ground truth using the three-person Delphi method. We had a um, number of, lots of uh, sentences to analyze, uh, over 16,755 sentences, sentence fragments. I'm just reliving the pain because I had to go through each one of those by hand. It took a month, myself and a grad student, and another person to uh, create the ground truth. I'm still suffering from that. <laughs> 
So we had uh, a bunch of parts and a bunch of uh, reviews. Not all were, were usable, but a good chunk of them were usable. You might say, Ray, why weren't they all usable? Well, you know, some people just say idiotic things. Um, and it's just unintelligible. Can't really use it. Uh, our accuracy was pretty high. 0.883, one would have been perfect. So the specificity, very high, 0.934. And um, is it always perfect? No, the minimum, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Not always perfect. Uh, wouldn't expect that. But pretty good. So that's the ability to find important aspects. Yep. Five minutes. Thank you. And uh, the ability to predict overall satisfaction. Our R squareds were extremely high. Not always perfect, right? So this is um, the uh, R squared when you, when you use the five point. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, what's your overall satisfaction? The binary is where we combined it into one, two, and three being uh, uh, I hate you, four and five is I love you. And uh, so when we did the binary, it's extremely high. And um, again, uh, so this is for the um, uh, for the ground truth, and then this is for the uh, text mining. So we're going to get some deterioration when, when we use instead of using just the ground truth, which is the absolute truth, uh, give or take a few errors. If we use text mining, you can see that there's a little bit of deterioration, okay, but not much. In a couple of spots, it deteriorates. And we would expect it to deteriorate because the, using the text mining is going to be an estimate. And the question that we had was, how badly does the text mining um, you know, kill you? Not too bad, but a little. So we said, let's do this for everybody. Let's do it. So this is the rest of the parks that we had data for. So 102 more. And overall, outstanding. But uh, can be better. So you see... R squared is 0.747. Okay, that's part number one. Could be better. But an R squared of 0.74 usually uh, for customer satisfaction data, this is outstanding. So even when it's bad, we had a couple that it just doesn't work. So in our R squared, we can actually get negative uh, R squared. Uh, I can show you the math. Uh, we don't have a bound of zero on ours. It's, if it's way off, the uh, calculation that we use can go negative. That just tells you that it's outside the relevant range. So if I did this and I saw an R squared value that was starting to make me nervous, like 0.555, I'd start to worry that, well, maybe that for that particular park, I'm not really picking up what I should be picking up. Or if it's a, brain, a bank branch for ATB, right? Or uh, a group of service reps for TELUS. So the benefits, uh, we were able to assess the importance of the aspects. You could reallocate resources to improve overall cus customer satisfaction. Um, you could uh, use this as markers for recommendation systems. And uh, we, uh, you're able to uh, evaluate a substantially larger set of data There's one more slide left. <laughs> questions? I have two minutes left. No questions. So I just wanted to ask, in your mind, what are the main differences? That includes a lot of people that are probably going to answer that. That's my question. Why don't we work in the same way? Right. <laughs> So um, you got to understand where our research is coming from. We're trying to create mousetraps that have absolutely never been thought of before. So this is uh, a very recent development. And uh, the Bayesian methods that we used were ones that we created. Uh, and uh, 
One of the drawbacks of this is that you have to stay within your relevant range, your bounds. You've got to stay within the lanes. So if you're doing, let's say, uh, hotels or restaurants, let's do restaurants. Restaurants, and you get outside the relevant range of what you trained it on, same problem as you'd have with a neural network. And you're going to see that come, uh, see that pop out in the uh, 4R squareds for your prediction. Uh, and that prediction was, by the way, um, taking what the individual said and say, okay, Given what you said, can I predict whether or not you said a five or a four, or three or two or one? And we do get pretty amazing results with that, but if it's outside the relevant range, we won't. Right? And what can be the uh, what can lead to an outside the relevant range? Well, using the wrong aspects. So the people that were talking about this uh, are saying things about completely different aspects that were never mentioned in your training set. So you have nothing to tag it into. And the other thing is using different language for the bag of non -nouns. So you have the bag of nouns and the bag of non -nouns. The key thing is to split those. And most of the research that you see is lots of If you look at the CompSci research that is I read, uh, they're still lumping it. And then they're not doing anything. They just say, okay, here's my text analysis. And uh, we want to do something. Another question? So with the so the system that you had kind of had to reject a couple of multi-intelligible gibberish, but um, how robust is the system for handling like minor typos and the letters and still, generally speaking, like valuable? So the question that you're asking is, do I have to clean my data? I, I don't have a, that's a great research project. <laughs> <laughs> you're always going to have to clean your data. So that's a great question. Um, now I'll, I'll tell you what academics normally do when they have aberrant uh, individual problems. We say, well, I don't know what's wrong here, but we're just going to ignore the two out of 102. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Ray. Uh, so as you can see, in 20 minutes, we can only just scratch the surface uh, sometimes, but uh, there's a lot more to this, and if you'd like to learn more, uh, feel free to contact Ray. He's happy to talk about his research, and, and I know I've heard it, some of his other talks on this uh, topic, and it's actually very interesting, some of the, the power of the negative review versus the positive review. Uh, he has some interesting stuff on that. So our next speaker is Daryl Humphrey, and he's going to talk about fraud detection. Hello, everybody. Uh, appreciate you coming out today. This is going to be an overview, 15 minutes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is fraud, make sure we have a shared understanding. And I'm going to talk about some of the work, a team that I led for about three years, uh, what we were doing to detect fraud and some of the different algorithms that we used. And hopefully give you some, some inspiration that it's easier to get started than you might think it is. It's harder to be successful at it than you'd like it to be. Okay? So there's some good parts and there's some bad parts about doing this kind of work. So what is fraud? Fraud is a behavior. This is important. I'm actually a psychologist by training, computer scientist out of necessity, uh, statistician <laughs> by, well, by necessity, I guess. And that's relevant because people commit fraud, right? It's a deliberate act to illegally gain a financial advantage. That's what we're trying to find. And it's driven by a number of things, economic conditions. What happens when the economy goes down? Fraud goes up. So does alcohol consumption, so buy stock then. Um, what's allowable in the industry drives fraud. The contracts you have with your providers, the vendors, what plans you might have if you're an insurance company. The data I'm gonna talk about is from benefit claims. So massage, physiotherapy, your orthotics, right? You might ever wonder why your orthotics all cost 400 bucks? Because the industry and the plan design says that's what we're gonna pay. 
Okay. So those things start driving out the type of fraud you see. Um, risk threshold and tolerance, every company's got to decide what they're willing to absorb. Okay. And in the end, though, it's criminal law defines the fraud. We use the term fraud in the industry because, say, fraud and abuse is difficult and people don't like to hear the word abuse, so we call it fraud. The reality is, I'm not finding fraud because only a judge is allowed to say if something's fraudulent. What I'm doing is finding transactions, patterns that are of greatest risk to the stakeholders that are, in fact, paying the bills. It's about robust prevention. That's where your policies, processes, metrics come in. And ideally, early detection. I'm going to spend my time today talking about early detection. Uh, there's an important assumption to make. If most people follow the rules, those that don't are anomalies. The data scientists in the rooms are going, yay, because I know how to find anomalies, right? They're the ones that stand out. But I believe it's important to remember that that's the assumption you're making. Okay? Because if you've got massive loopholes in your regulations and contracts, you could have a majority of people well, in fact, committing fraud. And you'd be finding the people that are doing it correctly. So it's important to remember that. The team that I, I was uh, doing ultimately came up with an ensemble model. We use a multivariate distance measure. The one we use is called a minimum covariance determinant. So we can talk later if you want to know what that's all about. Um, but it basically says an anomaly is going to be far away from everybody in an n-dimensional space. So you got nine dimensions, it measures distance simultaneously in those nine dimensions. So use k-means clustering, which Ray talked about a little earlier. We like these routines because they're repeatable and explainable. What do I mean by that? That means if I'm gonna do this distance measure, even though it uses a bootstrapping technique to go in and it grabs X number of observations, does its thing, it's going to give me the same answer every time I run it if I give it the same seed. Even if I change the seed, it's still going to give me an answer that's really close. So it's repeatable. And that's important because you're going to go forward and tell the vice president of sales that we've got this much fraud in this benefit plan and therefore you should take some drastic action. they got to feel confident about it, right? So repeatability is actually important. And I can explain it. Everybody understands the concept of distance, right? Neural net models, support vector machines, some of that stuff, you try explaining that to somebody that doesn't have any background, right? There's no inherent understandability to it. So what we do, so this is that robust distance score that I talked about. It's based on a chi-square distribution. So that red line at 4.18, that says that with nine variables in the model, that's the statistically significant mark, 4.18. You're on the left-hand side of that, you're normal. You're on the right-hand side, you're not. There's 1,200 dots on that diagram. Okay, there's 900 of them to the left of that line. That means there's 300 that, statistically speaking, are anomalous. So if each one of those is, I don't know, we'll pick on the physiotherapist just because. There's 1,200 physiotherapists there. 300 of them are statistically anomalous in their claiming patterns, potentially fraudulent. We got a team of investigators of five. There's no way they can look at all of that. There's just no way. So how do you decide which ones to go after? The easy answer says, well, you pick the ones that have really high RD scores because they're really anomalous and they've got high dollars at risk. What that means, that scale there means that most of their claims are in fact associated with these risky transactions. That sounds great, but if I just put that up there all with the red dots, right, without the k-means, if I just did the did the plot of the RD scores. This wouldn't help you because, again, we've got finite resources. 
the fact that we've got 34 of them that are high RD, high dollars, and they're all doing the same thing. Okay? What happens with people that are tend to break the rules? Who do they hang out with? Other people that break the rules, right? They share practices. So I know that if we go after one of these people, and in fact we find problems, we could prove it, we can then go to the other 33 and we know exactly what we're looking for. Okay? So your positive, your true positives jump tremendously. And in fact, we were able to, we went from a, basically a 15% hit rate, true positive rate, to 83 in 18 months, okay? which is a massive improvement. But we wanted to see if we could do better, because like I say, the repeatability is nice, but we'd like to have 100%, right? 99.99 if we could. So let's use algorithms that learn, that get better, right? That's the whole underlying value of the machine learning techniques. So we use several neural networks. We did random forest and we tried support vector machines. I'm just gonna give you a taste of which ones. Sorry, I grabbed my water. Uh, I don't wanna get into a religious debate about what machine learning is, and how it's different than AI and all that kind of stuff. So this is taken from uh, PwC, if you wanna go and get their definition, but you get the idea, right? Is that these things are all interrelated somehow because the underlying statistical theory and mathematical theory is, okay? So we are talking about a subset um, of these algorithms. Neural networks are called neural network because they're in fact were modeled off the physiology of neurons in the brain. So a lot of it comes out of neuroscience and psychology 40, 50 years ago, when they were in fact deliberately trying to mimic feedback cycle that happens when these two things fire. That's where the idea came from. Um, your, your basic feedback loop comes from that. Because our brain's really good at detecting things. That's what it does. Ever try to shut your ears off? Can't, because it's a detection system that can't be turned off. So we built a neural network using that same data on that k-means scatter plot. <laughs> And we found that even with a single layer, right, right here, so these are our variables. This is where we're predicting that's our hidden layer. We were getting in the low 80s, which is pretty good, right? We wanted to get into some deep learning, and I know most people in here have some training, so you understand. Really uh, smart. Right? It means it's, just, it's bigger, right? It's got more layers. Nothing more to the name than that. Uh, we, in fact, tried comparing some basic um, recurrent neural nets up there down into some deep learning. Didn't really get a lot of benefit for the computational cost that comes with it. So, what else could we try? Random forest is one that uh, actually is shown to be. Pretty good if you if you follow Kaggle and you know those types of ones. Random Forest does pretty good in classifications. Um, sometimes you you use it in an ensemble. But the basic idea again, you do sampling with replacement. You do it a couple hundred thousand times to see what the average output is. Right, you're averaging out the error because every model, every decision tree and have a flaw, depending on which node it happens to start with, right? And it agreed with the ensemble model we did before. So we divided up our, you know, those, those green dots and then the orange dots for the next ones. So that's our 80th percentile group of, of anomalous people. And when you take the random forest results, it grouped them quite uh, differently than it did the lower ones. So that's pretty good, even though they're mixed up in here at the, at the high end. When you consider that the, the basic model in the industry 
is almost random. If you don't have a tip on somebody, it's almost random. So getting anywhere like this is, is again, a big improvement. One thing I like about random forest is that it will give you an idea of which variables are driving that behavior. Okay, this is the mean drop in accuracy. And this says that if I got rid of variable six, I would get 100 more classifications wrong. And it drops down. So this is kind of telling us that we could probably use those four variables and do almost as well. Because random forests are computationally intensive. Support vector machines, SVM. Uh, we wanted to try these because we noticed there's a lot of nonlinearity in the data. So the SVMs are nice for that because they allow you to take this nonlinear scatter that's shown there now, you do a transformation on it, it finds a hyperplane and separates these two groups. And in fact, it did a slightly better job than the random forest. Again, we're interested primarily in this group and this group. These are the ones that are highly anomalous. They're my, what I want to be true positives. The last thing I want to do is go and harass somebody that's at the low end, right? Because they're doing things by the books. You don't want to create bad will in the, in the market. So we really like to see high numbers here. So what we showed is that, in fact, using these different machine learning techniques was doing as good as the, the robust distance k-means approach. We'd like to go further, but we needed better compute. Okay, we were running all these things on desktop machines that were purchased for word processing, quite honestly. Uh, it took a long time to run some of these. So Happily, you can go to any of these platforms. They'll have machine learning libraries for you. Uh, the one caveat is that each of these has, has zones, availability zones. So the stuff you might read about uh, on the net may not be available here. I think a lot of it is still uh, available only in the US. Software as a service, IBM Watson, you've heard of that. Data robots, another one. You just take your data, you throw it up at the site. It runs 21 different algorithms. It gives you a result. You want more control, you can bring stuff in-house. Okay. Those products are very expensive. Everything we did, we did with a combination of R, Python, actually it's R and Python for most of it, right? We can use Nine, Torch, TensorFlow. These are all free. Huge support communities. And there is training, right? You can send people to a series of courses, and these are reputable places. These aren't the fly-by-night right? certificate. These are places where you're going to get good training. But it's harder than you want to be because it's not about the technical training. If you don't have deep business knowledge, you won't be successful. The problem with these algorithms is they give you an answer. Any algorithm will give you an answer if you give it data. But the algorithm doesn't know if the data is relevant. It doesn't know if it's clean. It doesn't know if the assumptions are being held to. Right? So you've got to understand that. And people have to collaborate. Because in the end, you're serving a business. Right? You may find stuff that you think is really cool. You've got all the bad guys. But if the business hasn't been involved in determining what bad guy is, then you haven't done anything of value. This is the huge one. Labeled data is scarce. Right? To do the, the machine learning, you need hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of data. And if you're talking fraud, the amount of proven fraud is very, very small. So that's very hard to get. And your legacy IT systems, typically we're dead, built to share data. The IT department doesn't like skunk works. Right? You come in there and tell them, listen, I need an open source environment. I need you to stay out of it. I don't need it backed up. Right? Just leave me alone. Right? Not a message they're comfortable with. 
and they don't like you moving stuff to the cloud. Why? Because this is transaction data. This is the lifeblood of the company. They don't want it to go outside the firewall. This is a big one. Not everyone trusts black box algorithms. It's hard to explain how the neural net got to where it got to, right? There's, there's research going on in that area and stuff, so it's hopefully someday we'll change that. But this is huge. The nice thing about the distance is it's distance. People get it. Clustering, people get it, right? People hang together. You can explain that. And even though there's training available, it takes a broad spectrum of skills to make this something that a business would value. Because right? in the end, it's the business paying your salary, so if they don't understand and value what you're doing, you won't get anywhere. So your analytics team has got to be able to play across all of these areas. Not, not one person, but the team has to be able to speak to all of that. Two minutes for questions? Sure. Any questions? I'll take a really good <laughs> Yeah, we can make the obviously make this available. Yeah. So I think in product detection, feature is the most important. So what kind of feature you can use to make this work? Um, I can't really tell you all of that because then you would know how to commit fraud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some of the things we're looking at. Um, so simplistically, I think I used physiotherapy, didn't I? So physiotherapy on an infant. It happens for a variety of reasons. But if you've got a provider that's got an outlier on the percentage of their claims that deal with infants, that probably suggests that they they know families that are having children and they're just firing claims in on them, right? So that's one example. Um, so and it depends on the benefit line you're dealing with, right? That's where the contracts and the plan design comes in. So so it's anything where again, if you think about the business, right? Physiotherapy doesn't get done on kids below three very often at all, and really it starts usually when they get to be early teens and they're hurting themselves playing sports. That's usually when physiotherapy starts. So you can look, apply that business knowledge to say what would be an unusual. Everybody in the family going on the same day. Okay? Seems unusual. Got to be careful though, because if they're coming in from out of town, they're going to all go on the same day because they're coming in to do their shopping stuff, right? So now you need, so now we actually use postal codes and things like that to try to cut down on our false positives. Can you maybe speak a little bit about how you incorporate business users into the analysis and kind of how you, you know, stop them? Just whatever you're going to have to So, uh, really, we, we engage the senior manager, the managers of the business units that are responsible for the benefit line, and we said, walk us through your contract. What is the actual contractual relationship you have with these providers? Um, and, and why, right? Because they've obviously put a lot of work into those contracts, so we want to understand the thinking behind it. Um, we talk to them about what's the payment process, right? Because you can have a transaction in, in, a, in an enterprise legacy environment that said transaction was approved on Monday, but the money doesn't leave until two Fridays later because that's when the checks get run. Right? The legacy payment system is still set to fire every two weeks. So I was talking to him about that. Because if you're looking on dates of transactions, then in fact they're not real. So it's understanding their world and why it's there. Um, talking to them about what risk tolerance they have. <laughs> Like this idea, I can say this because I did it on the consultant now. This idea of zero tolerance for fraud is absurd. Right? If you find somebody that you can prove, hey, that 50 bucks is fraudulent, it cost you three grand to go get it. Right? So it was talking to them about what are your business risks that we can best put our resources in. Besides the content discussion, did you have any kind of? Um, this is the discovery session good or were they involved with like, 
So yeah, so so in the in that discovery and build up phase, we go away, we come up with some variables, right, based on the data that we had, we go back and say, can we get this data and stuff like that. Um, we ended up being able to bring in a, a wrangler that had been with the company for 30 years, so we knew everything about the data. That was huge. Um, so we went back and said, so here's, the, here's the 11 measures that we think are relevant. And we have it that they got to A, inform us, but also be comfortable with it. And then we had a monthly reporting framework that we put together. For every month, they kicked out a graph kind of like that and, and put, you know, proportion of dollars at risk so they could understand the volume that they were asking that this team to deal with, right? And help them understand, help them help us prioritize. So, and then we'd meet ad hoc. So the monthly reporting is going on, so at least they had an understanding of the projects we had and all that stuff. Uh, and then of course we would meet if there was somebody, if some provider popped out that was really a concern, or we actually tracked, we ran bi-weekly and monthly stats, we would track how often they showed up in that pool of anomalous people. And so we could say, listen, you've got a serial offender here. And even though they may be in the middle of a pack, they're doing it all the time. And so we need them to make a business decision what to do with that. So that would be kind of an ad hoc. All right, we'll have to save the questions for us afterwards. Uh, our final speaker is Ian. Hargreaves from ATB, uh, and just to see you get set up, uh, we are still looking for sponsors for the next events. So we have the uh, energy analytics coming in two months, and then two months later, we'll have data visualization. So if you would like to sponsor, it's a thousand bucks, pays for free food for everyone, and you can help us pick the speakers and everything, et cetera. So come talk to me after if you're interested. All right, Ian. Awesome. So 50 minutes, please, just, I don't know. I'll just drag me down when it's time. When it's, uh, um, so, uh, I mean, thanks everyone for your attention. I know I'm the last talk, and uh, you know, the sandwiches are metabolizing now, and so I'm probably starting to get a little sleepy. So uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I, I actually wish I had a presentation uh, like the two that we just saw, uh, you know, presentations um, that really explore an interesting application or topic. Um, rather than talking about a particular example, of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence that we've applied at ATP. Uh, what I'm going to do is spend some time talking about um, our, our process and how we tackle uh, a different but related problem, which is how do you take great work, like the work we've seen so far, and scale it and really make sure that it has a broad impact at the organization? Because doing the data science, uh, following those steps, testing out hypotheses, um, is gonna result in something. But how do you make that thing really live so it, it has a big impact? So I'm gonna begin just with a quick walkthrough. <laughs> it's a 15 minute talk. I don't know why I need this. Uh, but I'm gonna begin with a quick 15 minute walkthrough of um, uh, our process. Uh, we'll then talk about how we want data scientists to really be spending their time. And a hint, it's not as front-end web developers, it's not as people managing feedback communities or sending out surveys or you know selling um, the, the, the tools that they've created within the organization. It's probably doing data science. Finally, um, I'm going to talk about the approach we sell. Uh, which is what we refer to as sort of building the factory. And you know, what are the sort of structural elements that we've, we've brought up in the organization to help support data science so that it can flourish? Okay, so for those who don't know, uh, ATB Financial um, is a friendly crown corporation. Uh, it was actually created in the Great Depression um, in order to uh, serve Albertans. And you know, as a crown corporation, Alberta is our focus. Focus. Our, our mandate is here, and our, our real mission is to do a better job of understanding the needs of Albertans from a banking and financial services perspective than anyone else. Just up, shop, and you know, pack it up and leave. So um, you know, we're 80 years old now. That's 143 agencies, uh, 173 branches. We have just over 5,000 team members and about 730. Our, I mentioned our, our real mandate is to understand Albertans better than anyone else. Um, 
data is a big part of that. And you know, ATB listens, our enterprise data science team listens through data. OK, so this is what we look like. Uh, I had to digitally add a beard. I, I grew one over a vacation. Well, I tried to grow one over a vacation. Um, about 22 people strong. And uh, I think this is really incredible, because if we looked at the organization two years ago, it would, it would not look like this at all. Uh, so we actually have a very large uh, centralized enterprise data science team that's supported by uh, other pillars that cover your business intelligence, that cover um, you know, data quality, that help make us make sure that we're on side when it comes to regulatory and uh, compliance issues. But what's the ATB brain? So I'm just going to spoil it. So the idea is that uh, just like um, our brains, which exist really to guide action in the world, um, how do they do this? Well, they take in data, they make some kind of a decision or prediction about the world around and what's going on, and, uh, and they learn from the result. And these are sort of the three central elements that are, you know, machine learning is, is sort of perfectly positioned to to incorporate. Uh, so the ATB brain, the idea here is that you know, we're going to create um, a, a centralized hub that takes in customer data, that using a swarm of different models uh, and algorithms will make some kind of a decision. And by closing the loop on feedback from every decision we make, we're going to learn from the result. And slowly over time, our decisions are going to get better and better, and that network is going to get smarter and smarter. So it sounds really cool, and there's sort of a joke that if you like work in this space in any company for long enough, there will always be a brain. Like a brain is going to pop up sooner or later. It might just be like a, a rat spreadsheet. Um, the real question is, what problem are we solving? You know, by standing up the ATB brain. So let's talk about data science at ATB, and you know, a lot of data science. Um, where does it begin? It begins with a problem. So uh, some issue in the business, we need to know more about our customers. We need to make a prediction. We need to plan something. We need to predict customer needs. The branches are going to cry help. You know, the business is going to cry help. We, need, we have a problem that needs to be solved. Enter the data scientist who, uh, through a deep understanding of the problem at hand, um, an appraisal of the data that's available or the data that they can get, uh, and you know, alchemical tools that are really just math um, are able to produce a tool. And you know, the idea is this is some kind of tangible output, and it could be a report. You know, it it could be um, an interactive tool that feeds um, you know predictions about individual customers, individual branches. The point is, at the end of the day, the output is something. It's 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 got to be something that addresses that initial problem, and it's often up to um, some negotiation between the data scientists and the organization to figure out what that end tool is really going to look like. So tool is created, the problem is solved, everybody's happy, there's a big celebration. Our team, Enterprise Data Science, we've created a ton of really cool tools. <laughs> I, think, I think tools that I'm very proud of and that we should all be really proud of on our team. Uh, we've stood up recommendation engines for different lines of business. So, you know, like Netflix can recommend uh, things that they think you'll enjoy based on what they know about you. We're able to, you know, spot conversations that we could be having with our customers. And these aren't always product related. They could be um, just helpful advice, helpful advice and services. Uh, we've done cool things like create branch location optimization tools, you know, that use um, gravity models and, uh, you know, the idea of attraction to sort of understand where should we go, um, as well as all the kind of standard stuff that I think you'd expect from most organizations, customer segmentation, you know, understanding why customers break up with us, you know, where do we disappoint them and why do they leave, um, understanding the same thing about our team members, you know, what makes our team members happy. And what are the hallmarks of someone who's really going to be a productive, have a fantastic and productive and rewarding career? But every tool that we create or deliver is some ensemble of a bunch of algorithms. Uh, so take our recommendation engine. It is uh, a happy mix of um, something Markov-like, without, without giving spoilers away, there's, there's going to be some Bayesian decision processes in there. There's going to be, you know, whatever algorithms do the most work for us. Um, it's going to look at customer behavior. 
it may also just rely on some simple business rules. Like a lot, a lot of the time, if you need to make a recommendation to someone about, let's say, um, uh, you know, a, they're about to pay off their mortgage or they, they're, it's their birthday this week, you don't need a lot of advanced analytics to wish someone a happy birthday message and make sure that that message is getting out to customers. So you know, the key is that the tool is, is sort of a front end that solves some kind of business problem, uh, but the tool could be composed of a whole host of different algorithms that are all doing different pieces of work. And uh, you know, as by being on the enterprise data science team, we get the fun job of finding other cool things we can add into the tool uh, in order to really sort of round out its value proposition. Okay, so let's go back to that sort of data science um, example I was talking about earlier, where you begin with a problem and then a data scientist owns it and creates a tool that they then put in front of people. Um, sorry, the, the business. Um, the problem with this model is that it doesn't scale very well. And uh, you know, this is probably the best take home point from this entire talk, and, and it's 100% stolen uh, by Joaquin Cunaniaro Candela, who, who essentially does this work at Facebook. He's the director of applied machine learning at Facebook. Um, and it goes something like this. If, if you take someone who's very smart, a data scientist, um, someone working on their PhD, they're kind of a wizard. You know, if you give them enough time, they can crack that nut. They can solve the problem. It feels good to do it. So you know, no matter what the problem is, they'll understand it. They'll figure out what data they need. They'll run the analyses in order to produce some kind of tangible output. The problem with this model, when you when you take it and sort of apply it in an organization, is that you don't have infinite time. So <laughs> problems come in. And then problems start to come in fast. And multiple people want a little piece of your time. And one of the issues that you may encounter is that you've created all of these tools, and now you own them. So if the tool requires any kind of update or it isn't working well that day, you may find yourself doing technical troubleshooting on a web front end. You may find yourself talking to your technology partners to figure out why things aren't working. Um, and all of this work is really going to stress you out. And it's. So, so this wizard model, it, it doesn't scale very well. So the question is, well, well, how do we change work? How do we change data science work to allow people to create really cool stuff, but keep them happy <laughs> and, and keep them with us? And the key lesson is you can't hire yourself out of this, right? This isn't about just adding more data scientists, because sooner or later, they're going to own some tools. And then before they know it, 80% of their time is going to be bogged down in tool support. So you really need to focus on how you get the work done. OK, which brings us to the factory. So this is our approach to this uh, solving this problem. Uh, it's used by a lot of organizations. Um, what we did is we took those data scientists who were individual contributors, and we said, well, what's everyone happiest doing? <laughs> and, and we actually spun up three separate teams, core data science group. And these are our sort of principal developers. They take difficult to solve problems, and they produce uh, an MVP, that sort of you know, minimally viable product, uh, a razor sharp you know, test of that sort of um, uh, initial value proposition, something that, that answers that question, but in the, in the most narrow sense possible. We also have our lab. The idea behind the lab is when you're doing this, you're going to encounter a lot of technology barriers. You know, uh, it may be people's first time working in Google Cloud Platform. You may need to create your own web front end that you're going to put in front of the end users. So in order to provision all the necessities of that principal development work and subsequent scaling, we stood up the data science lab. And it's composed of essentially data science DevOps. These are your hardcore developers who take those cool ideas and those initial models and make a real tool, make something that you can actually put in front of people. Finally, you have the brain. And the idea behind the brain is that you're completing that sort of feedback. So you're taking that razor sharp value proposition and you're expanding it. Maybe your model, when it started out, it would just recommend products, right? It would just do something very simple. The idea is that this team's responsibility is to sort of broaden that value proposition, to make that tool sort of um, more useful and, and actually something that people will use. Because at the end of the day, if you make something, uh, it doesn't matter how cool the technique was or the model was, if nobody's using it, that was probably a waste of effort. So the key solution here, the key switch here, is the switch to APIs. 
So us owning the tool the entire way through. What we can do is have the data science team work with the lab to create that, that smallest thing, that smallest thing that allows you to test out, can we answer this problem? Put it in front of people. And then based on that, you're able to take those models, take those algorithms that were powering that decision and, and essentially make them accessible on their own, right, via an API, application programmer interface. And what that means is the business now, whether they're developing stuff for online or mobile or robots or Facebook Messenger, whatever, the application, they can reach out and connect with those same APIs. They can connect with those algorithms directly. So your product recommendation algorithm that used to be kind of a crummy tool that you put in front of people uh, is now an API that developers who make beautiful tools that team members already use, uh, they can just sort of hit up your essentially cluster of algorithms that, that you want to provide them with. Of course, you need feedback. Otherwise, you're never going to learn. You're never going to grow. But this is sort of the, the, the structural framework. It's the movement away from owning tools, end-to-end -to -end reporting, uh, towards self-serve reporting um, and APIs, that you don't end up owning the tool as a data scientist. Instead, you know, our data scientists can just work on tackling new problems. Which brings us back to the brain. So the idea is you know, we take customer data from our users using a swarm of algorithm. Uh, we, we make a decision on the best action. And by closing the loop on feedback, we're able to learn from the results. What's really cool here is that the switched API allows you to connect to all channels. And this is where you know, democratization comes in. You, know, you want that, that algorithm that's wishing someone a happy birthday. It can be really simple. Um, you want that to be the same algorithm regardless of how that customer is approaching you. They may be chatting with you in a call center. They may be live chatting with you via a chat bot. They may be in branch. They may be checking in their online portal. We don't know where they're going to come to us. But if you have the same intelligent algorithm serving all of that, that's, from their perspective, integrated, right? We know exactly where they are. We can learn about how they choose to engage with us. So we can get really smart. Uh, but we'd probably never get that way if we just had a happy birthday wish recommender that oh, was only for our call center and you know only for our online portal. OK, and I'm basically at time. So um, you know, it, uh, Really, another thing we have at ATB is um, a transformation team. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, talk to myself, talk to Dylan. Our transformation team is this awesome mix of um, people in digital who are building um, you know, online mobile experiences, um, ITSD, customer experience, data. Uh, so you know, structurally within the organization, we have a lot of support to actually make this model work. Um, to, to get away from owning the tools ourselves. Uh, we have great partnerships with the UFC. Uh, we've done a number of collaborations with uh, Computer Science Department at the UFC. Um, we have a, a blossoming relationship with the U of A and, uh, and Amy. Amy. Um, and uh, you know, we also just have great leaders. So I'll leave it with that, but are there any questions? How long has this model been in existence? Yeah, not long. So, um, you know, transformation, our, our really sort of big transformation is probably only about a year old. Um, so uh, it's, it's probably, I'd say, within the last um, we needed to change how we get the work done. Uh, so we kicked it off right away. Um, but moving to an API framework, it takes time. So I'd say over the last six months, we've been really sort of in this phase. Yeah. Yeah, really good question. So how different are the skill sets of the different three teams? Um, you know, it's, it's sort of funny. I'm sure anyone who's ever tried to hire a data scientist, it, it, there's always this kind of unicorn Venn diagram. Um, and everyone you get has some combination of those things, whether it's programming, whether it's um, sort of statistical knowledge, whether it's research knowledge, whether, um, uh, you know, all of that. So. I say everyone has, everyone can communicate. <laughs> like statistics is our, our sort of shared language, um, but uh, those skills are just weighted differently. So in the lab, you know, we have amazing coders, truly amazing coders. In um, science team, you know, these people have like 
unbelievable research backgrounds, brilliant minds, that, and, and it's more about what I think people are driven to do uh, that determines sort of which, which teams they'll end up on. Okay, we'll, we'll end it officially there, but Ian will be around for a few minutes. Uh, thank you for your talk, and that's fantastic. A very micro, uh, you know, problem solving to them. How do you actually make this work? Fantastic. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, to Daryl, to Ian, uh, and to Ray. And uh, we still have the room for another 20 or so minutes, I think. So you're welcome to stick around, grab some more uh, lunch, and come talk to me if you'd like to sponsor, or if you know some people who would potentially speak uh, at the upcoming events here in Calgary. So thanks again for being part of the, I would say, successful Lunchalytics Calgary. And we'll hope to see you again in two months. Thanks.